Okay. See lots of people here now. All right, so we'll jump in. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us today on uh, Friday for a webinar. We appreciate you being here. This is Nick Soberall with the Science Collaborative, as usual, hosting the Science Collaborative uh, webinar series, Collaborative Science for Estuaries. Um, I usually have a lot more housekeeping stuff that I run through at the beginning here, but we're going to do things a little different today in the interest of time and flow and uh, all the lovely voices we have joining us today. So what I'm going to do here is just cover quickly housekeeping, and then I'm going to pass it to Ashley for um, a way that she can get us started in a, a good way. So uh, what I will say is just that the chat is open to everybody. Um, Q&A is done through the Q&A feature so everyone can see it. So feel free to talk amongst yourselves and to ask questions as they occur to you throughout the webinar. Uh, we'll have some time for Q&A at the end. We've got lots of speakers to get through today who all have wonderful, excellent things to share with us. So in the interest of time, I will let Ashley start and she'll get us started. Uh, Dai Galagahai. Uh, Gala Chil Hamakami. Um, hello and good day. It's good to see you all. Um, Ashley Russell Sinsanu. Ashley Russell, I'm called. Uh, Milikma Pamuki Ka'au. Uh, I'm a Milik and Pamuki person. Um, and I would like to share um, a song with you. Um, it's, a, it's a round dance song. It's called the Friendship Song. Very old song. Um, from my uh, tribal people to get us started. Um, so I'm going to stand for this and hopefully it will, uh, you guys will hear it fine over Zoom. <laughs> if not, I apologize, but we'll try it. <clears throat> oh, no, 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 no. Hey, no, 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 Oh, no, 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 Hey, no, 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 Hey, no, 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 Thank you, Ashley. Oh, it's really nice to hear your voice. Um, Nick, can you go to the next slide for me? So the presentations that we're sharing today, we originally developed for uh, a presentation that we did at Restore America's Estuary Summit in New Orleans in December. And the work and the travel and um, the effort really was supported financially by the organizations, um, by the Science Collaborative and Restore America's Estuaries and NERA. And so we're really grateful for, for all of those folks um, for helping us helping us get there and helping us do this and, and glad for the opportunity to share more broadly with everyone who's here today. Um, I'm Deanna, I'm the director at the Lake Superior National Estuary and Research Reserve. And I'm gonna introduce uh, Bree Turner, to provide a little bit of context for us. Bree is a senior coastal management specialist 
on contract to NOAA's Office for Coastal Management um, to support the National Estuarine Research Reserves. She has 20 years of diverse experience working in the coastal management sector with federal governments, nonprofits, state agencies, tribal governments, and universities. She's a pretty good friend too, so I'll pass it over to Bree. Thank you. Next slide, please, Nick. It's um, great to be here and thank you for the invitation to join the session. I'm calling in from Seattle, the traditional land of the Coast Salish people. And um, when we reviewed the registrant list, it was clear that participants are joining today from a variety of regions and organizations and likely with a wide range of experience working with tribal indigenous communities. So we acknowledge it's not possible to give a short context setting that's gonna meet everyone where you're at, but we do wanna share a couple key concepts and terms that you're gonna hear throughout the session that we thought were important. Next slide, please. So tribal nations, um, there are 574 sovereign tribal nations within the US that have formal nation to nation relationships with the US government. Tribal nations are part of the unique American family of governments within a nation and as, as well as sovereign nations in the global community of nations. And native people and governments have inherent rights and political relationships that does not derive from race or ethnicity. And I think that's a, this last point is, is a stumbling block that I have seen in some of the diversity, equity and inclusion space within the in the coastal management, estuarine management um, sphere. So please keep that in mind. Next slide, please. So tribal sovereignty, this is a key word. It's a legal word for an ordinary concept, basically the authority to self-govern. And tribal sovereignty ensures that any decision about the tribes with regards to their property, their land, their, their people are made with their participation and consent. And a common refrain I hear is nothing about us without us. And um, it, it looks like we have a lot of folks from state agencies online today. And so it's important to note that sovereignty can also apply at the state level where government to government relations uh, exist through compacts or other agreements. And Leanne's gonna get into more about that. Um, treaties and along with the Supreme Court and the president and the Congress have repeatedly affirmed that tribal nations retain their inherent power of self-government. Self and this includes managing their lands and indigenous people and, and local communities cover a third of the earth's territory. And, and the fact that 91% of them, of these lands are in good and, and fair ecological condition is, is a testament to the effectiveness of long-term indigenous stewardship in, in managing these complex natural environments. And so I'm, I'm really pleased that Ashley's able to join us today and share um, what she's been up to. And I'll just you see at the bottom of that slide, there's a link um, or a note to the tribal nations in the United States in introduction. It's a primer developed by the National Congress of American Indians. I'm gonna include a link in the chat. This is a great, um, 101 on, on, on tribal sovereignty as well as some of the other concepts I'm sharing today. So I'll make sure to include that. Next slide, please. So treaties, I mentioned those briefly earlier. There's 370 of them. They have no expiration date. And I encourage you to see if, uh, if you have one in the area that you work. Um, please look that up. Uh, treaties vary widely in their terms and provisions. I'm not going to get into the details of that, but I, I highlighted for you that it's common to include hunting, fishing, and foraging rights that are often on lands outside the reservation boundaries or their, their lands. Um, so that the, the map here is the treaty that covers the area in Washington that I grew up in, and you will see the and the usual and custom harvesting areas are much broader than where the tribal communities are located. And this is an important point when trying to figure out what tribal partners you would be invested in your coastal project you're working on. And um, I'll, just to this note, and speaking about lands, and you'll hear Ashley talk about 
the, her ancestral lands. And so these, those, these lands are much broader than maybe what you'll see as a reservation on a piece of map, on, on a map somewhere. Um, treaty making ended in 1871. Since then, relations are formalized through congressional actions, executive orders, and other agreements. And this is really important because in this current administration, we've been seeing a lot of these kind of agreements come out. And Deanna is going to speak to that later on. Next slide, please. So indigenous peoples, communities, this is a term that we're seeing used increasingly. And it's because it's, it's a more inclusive term to include groups who have descended from and identify with the original habitats, inhabitants of a given area. And, and so this could include the state recognized tribes, indigenous and tribal community based organizations, those living out of the communities that they've descended from, maybe in an urban space, uh, native Hawaiians, Pacific Islanders. Um, again, you know, it's, it's, it's just a much more common term that we're seeing and, and actually it's a term that we use in our, in our title of our web seminar today. Uh, next slide. And so the last um, concept term that we wanted to share with you in context setting is environmental justice. And likely you all are familiar with the concept. It, you know, it's based on the reality that certain groups in society bear unequal environmental and economic burdens. And there has been a growing acknowledgement that the traditional understanding of environmental justice has not served indigenous communities well. And this is because the kinds of environmental justice oftentimes they're faced is largely in part from centuries long removal or forced dislocation or displacement from their lands. And so it's really great to see, um, and let me give a shout out to the California Coastal Commission who recently released uh, their environmental justice policy. And I, I, if you can see in there, one of their principles, they're centering tribal engagement. And so I see, I see this as a really great new direction heading forward for the environmental justice movement. And I'll, I'll include a link in the chat to their, um, their environmental justice policy as well. Um, and so I'll just to wrap up here is like, while my role was to provide a really brief and broad legal context for what is required by state and federal governments in the government to government consultation and engagement process, um, I have to say, as someone personally who's motivated by my heart, I also want to emphasize to you um, that if your work, if your organization lacks some of these more formal guiding legal frameworks, still do this work. It's important work and do it because it's going to make your community stronger, your stewardship outcomes broader and more impactful. And you just might end up with some new friends, like in the case of Alice, Ashley, and Tahani, and you're going to hear from more from them later on. And that's it for me. Okay, thank you, Bree. And I think next up is Leanne Burke, and she is the Tribal Affairs Manager for the Puget Sound Partnership. Uh, Leanne, take it away. Hi, thank you. Um, Hi everyone, we are happy that you're here. My name is Leanne Burke and I am the Tribal Affairs Manager for the Puget Sound Partnership and an enrolled citizen of the Lumbee Tribe of North Carolina. Nick, next slide. Uh, with this presentation, I'm going to give a brief overview about the context and development of the Washington State government's approach to tribal co-management, the role of tribal liaisons, and how these come together in some examples within the Puget Sound Partnership. Next slide. So first to start off, uh, the Puget Sound Partnership is a state agency leading the collective effort to restore and protect Puget Sound. The partnership brings together hundreds of entities to mobilize action around a common agenda, advance Puget Sound investments, and advance priority actions by our supporting partners. We're uh, different than the, than the NERS program and that we receive the bulk of our funding from the federal Puget Sound Estu National Estuary Program. Next slide, please. I wanna give Bree a thank you for some context setting. This makes this slide a little bit easier. So uh, we are a regionally bound uh, state agency. And so within the Puget Sound Salish Sea area, there are 19 federally recognized tribes, 17 of which have the affirmed treaty rights to hunt, gather, and fish in their off-reservation usual and custom areas. 
And as we mentioned, there are 45 tribes across the lower 48 that have these rights enshrined in their treaties. And of those 45 tribes, 27 of them are in the Northwest uh, Washington region. So the U.S. Supreme Court affirmed the tribe's role as co-managers of treaty protected resources and their right to half of the sustainably harvestable salmon and shellfish. Implicit in these treaty rights is the responsibility of the state to protect and restore these resources and the habitats that they need. Next slide, please. In 1989, uh, the federally recognized tribes in the state of Washington signed the Centennial Accord, and this formalizes the commitment to government and government relations on the issues of shared interest and to promote collaborative best management practices. So this is really the foundation of how the Puget Sound Partnership engages with tribal governments. And since the accord was signed, agency responsibilities um, and obligations have been reaffirmed by the Washington State Tribal Millennium Agreement and codified uh, into laws and through both through executive acts and, oh, sorry, both through legislative acts and through executive order mandates. And I want to stress that respecting tribal sovereignty any participation by a tribal government in this process is entirely voluntary. It's also important to note that any government to government consultation must by its very definition be independent of any other public participation, participation process and regardless of whether the agency receives a request for consultation. So this means that as an agency, we are expected to go to each tribe for consult individually and by their preferred protocols, rather than expecting the tribal nation to come to us. So we really strive to have active engagement at the staff level, um, in addition to leadership, and well in advance of elevating any formal uh, consultation with leadership. So our goal is that nothing comes to leadership um, out of the blue that they haven't already been invite, uh, involved in. So we do recognize that this uh, need for con consultation has to be balanced. Um, outside of all the federal levels of consultation, running their own governments and taking care of their communities, uh, within Washington, there are more than 40 state agencies that seek tribal engagement on a whole variety of topics. And so it is really easy to overwhelm tribal leaders and staff um, and places an undue burden on their time, energy, and resources. So it really falls to us as a state agency to recognize our potential impacts and to engage with the governments in the manner that, that they want to be engaged with. Next slide, please. So I know we uh, a lot of the folks on the line are with nonprofits, um, but as an agency, we do have codes that dictate our actions. And so what does that look like? Um, in our codes, at a minimum, each agency must develop a consultation framework for, the for each tribe. And as I mentioned, protocols may vary from nation to nation, and we are to follow the tribe's preferences. The agencies have to make reasonable efforts for collaboration in the development of policies, agreements, and program implementation uh, that directly affects tribal interests and lands. Each agency is required to designate a tribal liaison who reports directly to the head of that agency and ensures that tribal liaisons and the executive directors of each state agency receive government-to-government -government training. So depending on the size of the agency, there may be a team of up to six staff dedicated to this work, in like, for example, our Washington State Department of Transportation, or in the case of much smaller agencies, uh, the liaison duties may be assigned to somebody who might have additional um, primary duties. We are also required to submit an annual report to the government on the activities each agency uh, engages in related to with uh, with tribal involvement and it has gone um, further to uh, the state hosting an annual centennial report, which is an in-person two-day gathering where agencies report out to the governor and there is an opportunity for roundtable discussions with tribal leaders to elevate issues of concern in a, in a, uh, directly um, to our governor face-to-face. And lastly, um, and this is just with Centennial Accord um, requirements, uh, 
agencies are required to identify within their processes what is considered a significant agency action. And if something falls into that category, that triggers a mandatory uh, uh, consultation uh, offer. And so that can be something along the lines of uh, uh, development of new policies, new grant or loan programs, capital projects, um, things of that nature. Next slide, please. So um, what do tribal liaisons do? Um, now, as a disclaimer, my job description is much longer than this list you see here on the slide, and there can be variations on the title. Um, you could be a tribal liaison, you can be a tribal affairs manager, you can be a director of tribal engagement. It, it can vary from agency to agency, um, and the scope of responsibilities may um, expand with that. So the, the minimum responsibilities that are established per code is to assist the agency in developing and implementing policies that promote effective communication and collaboration. We serve as the primary contact person for tribal governments to maintain communication. And we coordinate the training of state agency employee, employees in government to government relations. So that is just kind of the, the minimum of what we do. Uh, we can also be tasked with duties uh, assigned by new legislation and executive orders. Um, so here in Washington state, we, with the recent passage of the Healthy Environments for All Act, there's a greater role of tribal liaisons in there. And we also have a pro-equity anti-racism initiative uh, established through executive order that also assigns additional roles in the context of that by the governor. So is where we sit within the agencies. Um, I am part of our agency's executive office and I work very closely with our executive director, our equity and environmental justice management manager and our, our leadership team. And I really have about equal, um, I spend about equal time on internal uh, affairs as I do external affairs as I am the in-house um, resource for staff. Next slide, please. Okay, so how does this all work once we've got our internal workings figured out? Um, the partnership has gone to great lengths to include tribal engagement opportunities throughout our entire operations. And so this slide here shows our collaborative government structure within the partnership, which we call the management conference. Um, some of these boards are uh, set by stature, by for example, our leadership council, our science panel, and our ecosystem coordination board. And we are very proud to say that there is tribal representative of either staff or elected officials throughout um, every one of our boards and councils. Next slide, please. So narrowing our focus even more within the government management conference, I'd like to highlight one group, um, which is called the Partnership Tribal Co-Management Council, otherwise known as PTEC. And PTEC was established about 12 years ago as a joint effort by the partnership and participating tribes and tribal consortia. The function of PTEC serves as an additional communication channel between individual tribes and the partnership. And this is where we can have more informal uh, discussion and our presentations on things of mutual interest or concern. Um, this is a monthly opportunity for us to meet, which is important since all of our work within the partnership affects treaty work um, resources. And this, uh, this meeting is uh, designated um, or is designed specifically to be more informal to allow uh, for free-flowing free change of information. We don't set time limits on our agenda items. And our agenda is developed in partnership with our partners. So we don't come to these meetings with foregone conclusions or dictating how the discussions are gonna flow. Um, participation in PTEC is voluntary and it's co-chaired by uh, a member of the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission and the chair of our partnerships leadership council. And this forum has, been, um, has greatly helped identifying areas of concern and um, well ahead of time. So next slide, please. So an example of how this collaboration shows up in our actual work 
Um, as a result of this work, our latest action agenda for Puget Sound, which we published last year, has expanded our vision for a restored ecosystem. And importantly, this version for the first time includes harvest hatchery and adaptive management of salmon recovery strategies. And this section was written entirely by rep tribal representatives. So we feel confident that uh, for the tribes that chose to participate, their needs and priorities are clearly um, communicated in this, in this context. So tribes have been instrumental in identifying and vocalizing persistent barriers that impede recovery efforts, including a lack of political will sometimes, um, to take on some of the more challenging and necessary actions for recovery. So um, tribes are vocal um, advocates for things such as reforming ag agricultural practices, addressing population growth issues, and um, continuing to scrutinize our current land use regulations. And so we recognize that without the persistent and vigorous efforts of tribes to uphold and defend their treaty rights and their cultural practices, and having tribes initiate and complete vital, often ambitious restoration projects, Puget Sound recovery would not be possible and would not have evolved to the level that it has now. Next slide. So thank you, that's the end. Thank you, Leanne. Okay, I think Deanna is up now. It's Deanna Erickson is the director of the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve, and she has got a presentation for us as well. Thanks, Nick. Uh, you can go to that next slide. All right, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you from the Lake Superior headwaters, so shifting out of that Pacific Northwest for a minute and over to get to Game, the, the great sea of the Ojibwe people. Um, I'm the director at the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve. Um, I live here in Anishinaabe or Ojibwe country. Um, I'm a person of Polish, German, and Swedish descent and very lucky to live in such a neat place. Today, what I wanna do is very briefly share um, some insights on how shared governance and formal agreements can underscore partnerships that sustain land and culture. And go to the next one, Nick. So up at the headwaters of the estuary, so the top of the estuary, that place is called Nagachiwanong. That's where the water stops and slows down. The estuary is vast, it's ecologically important, it's culturally and spiritually important. It's the place where wild rice grows, so that's the, the bed of restored wild rice that you see in this photo. Um, and wild rice and Spirit Island, and it's a place that drew Ojibwe people here in the first place through prophecy, um, through long voyages from the East Coast. And so everything that we do at the reserve happens in this context. Next slide. So we're here in the uh, city of Superior, Ogete O Danang, um, which is the old town. Um, on Chigame Zib, the St. Louis River, the Great Sea River um, at the headwaters of the Great Lakes. So we sit um, on the border between the 1854 and the 1842 treaties. We also are on uh, the border between Wisconsin and Minnesota. And every, uh, every one of our 16,000 acres within the reserve boundaries um, includes ceded territory rights to hunt, fish, gather, and practice traditional life ways in this place. Next slide. So when the reserve was uh, just an idea back in the mid 2000s, um, folks went up to the Fond du Lac Band of Ojibwe people, they're also a Fond du Lac Band of Chippewa, but Chippewa is not a real word. So I'm just gonna use Ojibwe for now. Um, and said, hey, we're thinking about this thing, this, this National Estuarine Research Reserve, what are your thoughts? And folks at Fond du Lac were like, that's a really important place to us, and we would like to be, to have some formal agreements in place while that happens. And so a memorandum of agreement was reached between NOAA and the folks working uh, in Fond du Lac, um, 
involving the folks working on designation through University of Wisconsin Extension, which is my employer. And that recognized what now we would say it would call indigenous knowledge, but the special expertise of the Fond du Lac Band in this place. So that was just while the reserve was generated. That led to, next slide, in 2010, the memorandum of understanding that makes this reserve exist. So we don't own land here. Extension doesn't own land. The reserve is built through partnerships. We have federal agencies, state agencies, and the Fond du Lac Band as signatories to the document that makes, makes my job <laughs> happen. That's nice. Um, so because of that signatory status to our memorandum of understanding that makes the reserve exist, Fond du Lac has a perpetual seat on the advisory board of the reserve, which means that they participate in advisory governments and help us develop our management plan or our plan to do everything from the very beginning. So over time, next slide, that has played out through the work of the reserve and the programs of the reserve because we always have points of contact from the very beginning. So in our education program, um, Tom couldn't be here today, it was sad, but Tom uh, Howes, the resource manager at Fond du Lac um, Resource Management Program has spoken with every single teacher who has gone through our Teachers on the Estuary, our Rivers to Lake program. They've spent a day at the reservation. They've met with our elder friend, Mark McConnell, who's in the audience today. And they learn about sovereignty. They learn about ceded territory rights and they learn about indigenous stewardship. Next slide. In our stewardship program, we're dealing with a lot of invasive species, including um, at this site, which is a really culturally important island. And we're not able to address those issues on our own in a way that takes care of the land um, and it takes care of the spiritual importance of that place. But we can if we do it with Fond du Lac and we do it with Fond du Lac invasive species staff. Also, they have a lot of expertise that we don't have in house and it has been hugely important for us to work on these issues together. Next slide. A project that we've played a supporting role in led by Dr. Evan Larson and Melanie Montano with the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission, as well as several elders and students from Fond du Lac Tribal and Community College um, is looking at helping to understand the history of cultural fire on the sandbars that form our estuary and the sandbars along Lake Superior. So we've been able to really help that help carry some of the needs of that project so they can do this work. They found some amazing fire records as well as culturally modified trees that tell the story of um, people's ancestors in this place and also what we might need to do in the future to really properly restore ecosystem health and medicine plants and food plants to, to the estuary. Next slide. Fond du Lac has treatment as a sovereign or treatment as a state in their water quality and their air quality um, regulations. That means they went through more than a decade, I think, of paperwork to get recognition that their laws are law um, related to water quality standards. And so over the years, we've worked with syncing up our water quality monitoring, timing, our parameters, um, and sometimes like the in this photo, just getting out on a boat together so we have a little bit of efficiency and company when we're doing water quality monitoring. Um, and right now we're engaged in a long term, like a long term visioning process that's happening through science collaborative funding to help us figure out where best to monitor and what best to monitor in the future that Fond du Lac is playing a key role in. Next slide. So all of this is important, um, but it's even more important because some of the places in the reserve are so um, significant um, in the ancestral sense, in the spiritual sense, and one of those places is Wisconsin Point. And this last August, this is this, a photo from the ceremony where um, a, a really important cemetery um, and the village site within the reserve boundaries was regained by the Fond du Lac Band from the city of Superior. And that means that not only are 
are is Fond du Lac and Ojibwe people ceded territory rights partners. They're also landholding partners within the reserve. And so this is really important. It's the first time that's ever happened in a national estuarine research reserve um, where tribal tribally held land has been part of our within our boundaries. Next slide. So this is from Quote and Evan and Melanie um, and Dr. Kimmerer from a, a proposal for that Ishkode project, the fire project. Um, in, the, in this place and in many coastal places, the exclusion of indigenous values, perspectives, and participation in the management has reduced the resiliency and biodiversity of cultural ecosystems. We can see that with the loss of fire. We can see that with the loss of care of medicine plants. We can see that with the loss of minomen or wild rice. And that has really um, negative impacts on Anishinaabe, on Anishinaabe people. It also has negative impacts on the landscape. So when those relationships are restored, when those approaches to stewardship are restored, we are able to also have the restoration of, um, of communities. Next slide. I'm going to put a link in the chat. This is at the, my local scale down here uh, in Superior, but this is really happening at the national level too, um, that the Biden administration is working towards um, better inclusion of indigenous knowledge in federal decision making through a memo that came out in November. It's a darn good read. Um, and it draws from a lot of tested, um, tried, and true uh, approaches that um, I've seen work really well here and up in Ojibwe country. So I recommend people check that out. Thanks. Thanks, Deanna. All right, um, the last part of our presentation here, we've got three speakers who are going to talk to us about the role and importance of culturally significant species and restoration projects. So I'd like to welcome back Ashley Russell, who's a Malik Coos tribal member and the assistant director of the CTCL USI Culture and Natural Resources Department. Dr. Alice Yates, the stewardship coordinator at the South Slough National Estuarine Research Reserve, and Tahani Maltier is a senior undergraduate student studying global environment science at the University of Hawaii. And welcome to all of you. Uh, Galanik, will you proceed to the next slide, please? Which is basically the same as the last slide, but um, <laughs> again, uh, Dai, hello, uh, Ashley Russell, Sensenu. Uh, as Nick said, um, I'm a Milik Coos and Kamunki person. Um, I'm an enrolled citizen of the Confederated Tribes of the Coos, Laurel and Sayusla Indians, also known as CTCLUSI, because our title's way too long to say. But it's important. Um, and I'm the assistant director uh, of the, our cultural natural resources department for the tribe. Um, I'm honored to be here today um, to, to speak with you all. Um, and before we dive into the role and importance of culturally significant um, species and restoration projects, I should probably give you guys a quick history uh, slash geography lesson. Um, so Nick, if you could proceed to the next slide. Um, so you guys heard Bree talk about um, ancestral territory, um, and so this is um, the ancestral territory of um, my tribe. So again, we're a confederated tribe. Uh, we're composed of four bands. Um, there's the Shayushla, which is um, uh, Sayusla in the Englishized version, um, in the north, um, Kui, Chilo, or Amqua. Um, in the middle there, and then Hanas and Milakus in the south. And our ancestral territory encompasses 1.6 million acres. Um, and in 1846, um, so give you a little bit of history about Oregon, because I know we have um, participants from all over. The, all over. Um, so in 1846, Great Britain transferred sovereignty um, of the Oregon Territory to the United States. Um, and then Oregon became a state um, in 1851, I believe. Um, and so in between that time, um, the tribes here in Oregon were pretty much left alone, um, but the federal government was creating what was called a Great Coast Reservation, which was just north um, of the Shayushla territory. It kind of overlapped a little bit. Um, you had all sea people just north of the Shayushla people, 
Um, and so it went up from what's called Yahats today all the way up to uh, the Washington border. So that Great Coast Reservation encompassed millions of acres. Um, and then in 1855, so just a couple years before Washington started uh, going to tribes and signing treaties, um, the federal government approached Oregon tribes and began um, uh, drafting treaties. Um, and so our treaty was um, signed in 1855 by our tribal people, but it was never ratified. So my tribe is one of the 45 that Bree had mentioned earlier today that our treaty was never ratified. Uh, in that treaty, uh, we were promised compensation, food, clothing, employment, education, um, health benefits, housing, um, but it never happened. Um, and then a year later, um, the 1856 Rogue River uh, Wars happened. Um, Rogue River's just um, about a little over two hours south of us. Um, and the people here in Coos Bay were afraid that we were going to join the war with them. And so um, they, uh, they, as in military personnel and um, local colonizers, uh, rounded us up at gunpoint. Um, and uh, forced us up to a fort um, in the Umpqua territory called Fort Umpqua. It's on the Umpqua River near Reedsport. Um, so we were there for a couple years. And then in 1860, uh, we started our own Trail of Tears, which we were marched 60 miles up the coast um, to the Great Reservation. Um, and in between, when the Great Reserva Coast Reservation was created, there were people in Corvallis um, that wanted to have a train um, built to um, the coast so that they can export um, some of their, um, their trade. And so that was uh, Newport was created. And so it divided the Great Coast Reservation into two and created the Alsea sub-agency in the South. And so that's where uh, my great, 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 great grandmother um, was marched to. Um, luckily, she escaped uh, and uh, came all the way back down to Coos Bay. And uh, my uh, great uncle says that she hid in a Port Orford cedar tree for a couple months there before um, my great, 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 great grandma, grandfather found her. And it was said it was love at first sight. And he married her. And um, now I'm here today. <laughs> but that's a long story. Um, so uh, going back to some of the history, um, then in, uh, let's see, where are we at? So that 1855, the treaty was never ratified. Um, and then in 1876, um, the federal government decided to close the LC sub-agency. Um, and so our, a lot of our tribal members um, were asked to either um, Go join the Silettes, the Confederate Tribes of the Silettes, which they're, I believe they're like 24, 28 bands. There's, they have a lot of bands um, confederated in their tribe. Or they can just go home, but they, they wanted them to leave. So a lot of our tribal members went, went back home. Um, so you guys see this, you know, extensive territory. And so they, you know, they just, they went back home. They were tired of being promised things. And, you know, at that time, like half of our tribal members had already um, perish from like starvation and abuse because they weren't evil, able to leave the reservation to go, um, you know, harvest uh, what they needed to survive. Um, and then so um, the fight was on to um, get our treaty ratified and actually get compensation. Um, but then the Western Oregon Termination Act happened um, in the 40s, uh, which terminated a lot of tribes in Oregon. Um, so my tribe was one of them. In 1954, um, we were terminated. Um, and I, my grandma still has this letter that states that um, the, the federal government no longer rec recognizes her as an indigenous person, which, you know, looking back now, it's, it's, it's a little funny because you can't, you can't say, oh, I'm not that, I'm not that person anymore, but um, and then luckily in 1984, we were re-recognized after 30 years of fighting. Um, 
so I mean it's been a struggle for my people um but uh so that's a little bit about the history um next slide please Nick so now we'll talk about the watershed so there's three watersheds within the 1.6 million acres um the first one um is the Shayushla um well sorry it's called Iktatu, which means the big one. Um, and it's Shai Ushla um, Utskwich, which means Shai Ushla in Lower Umqua for the big one. Um, in English, it's called the Shai Ushla River because people can um, say uh, Shai Ushla. <laughs> um, and next slide, please, Nick. I think we're running out of time, so I better rush through this. And then, funnily enough, um, the uh, Amkor River is also known as Iktatu, the big one. Uh, Shayushla uh, and Kweech, they share, um, they're in the same language family, so they share a lot of um, the same words. Sometimes they're different, sometimes they're not, but they're, you know, they're within uh, 40 miles of each other. So um, they, <laughs> that one's also called the big one, so it gets a little confusing. Uh, next slide, please, Nick. And then uh, we have uh, Kukwishishti, which is the Kus River. Um, that's where my people are from. Um, and it's called Kus Bay. Um, next slide, please, Nick. Um, and I forgot to mention, so within that, um, the, uh, the Great Coast Reservation and within our ancestor territory, we also have, you know, because during the reservation area, a lot of tribal members um, were brought to various reservations all over um, the uh, state of Oregon. So we have a lot of tribal members um, that are enrolled in other tribes um, to just, so just to become re-recognized, a lot of the bands had to uh, confederate together um, in order for the federal government to recognize them as a tribe. So we have uh, three tribes, um, that call this place home. So we have the Confederated Tribes of the Selects, uh, the Confederated Tribes of the Kusla and Quonsaysla Indians, which is I'm a citizen of. And then we also have the Coquel Indian tribe. And um, <clears throat> um, I love this saying, this is a saying um, by our cultural stewardship manager, Jesse Beers, um, uh, who also, he, he always likes to say, the place provides the culture and the culture stewards a place. And that's talking about the connection because without, um, you know, with people being on a land for thousands of years, um, they, uh, that's where their culture um, comes from, you know, their traditional stories. Um, they, they have this um, inherent relationship uh, with the land and, you know, they, um, they have stewarded that land since time immemorial. Um, and so when the um, settlers came, they, they saw this, this vast, Un, untouched forest that, um, um, you know, just looked like it had tons of opportunity to manipulate. And we had to say, no, it's, we've been stewarding it, you know, uh, <laughs> it's just so, it's just a well-managed forest because uh, we, you know, have relationships with the, with this place and, and the inhabitants of this place are, our um, brother um, and sister bears and, you know, all the, the, um, wing it and four leg and then apologize they're doing some um drilling outside but <laughs> um so as i said our landscape uh has to find us for millennia um it's influenced our language um and our songs um and it's uh helped shape um our practices that are unique features of, to our identity um um and uh talk about the painting here this was um in, in the slide was done by um, a Queech um, tribal member, uh, Pam Stelsler. And it talks about the uh, creation story of our people. Um, so two young arrow men came down and placed blue clay because um, the, the planet at that time was all water. And so it formed land and then they broke um, tule mats and baskets. And so um, that, that uh, kept the tide back. And then they started to plant um, bald eagle feathers, which um, turned into Douglas fir trees and then animals came. And, and um, so that's how the, the earth came to be. Uh, next slide, please, Nick. 
And I also have to, I'll always have to mention uh, TEK or traditional ecological knowledge um, because that's that's what tribal people um, they have. It's inherent. It's in our blood. It's passed down to us from our elders. Um, and it's it's the knowledge held by indigenous peoples about their immediate environment and the cultural practices that build on that knowledge. It includes an intimate and detailed knowledge of plants, animals, natural phenomena, the development and use of appropriate technologies for hunting, fishing, trapping, agriculture, forestry, a holistic knowledge or worldview, which parallels scientific discipline of ecology. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and I also like to coin uh, resources stewardship, uh, which is an ethic that embodies the responsible protection, use, and enhancement of natural resources through sustainable practices and thoughtful management. And pictured here um, is our chief, Doc Slider. Uh, he's holding Pacific Lamprey. Um, and uh, one of our tribal chairmen, Doug Barrett. And they are processing a Pacific Lamprey with um, a, a freshwater mussel shell. And it said that you can only um, process it with a freshwater mussel shell, because if you don't, um, it angers uh, the water beings and they'll bring um, up floods and um, that'll destroy your traps. Um, so apparently it happened often enough where we've been told through story that you don't, that's the only thing you can use. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and here's a newer uh, term um, that uh, Dr. Kavika Winter, um, who couldn't be here today, um, he's the director of the um, Estuarine Research Reserve in, in Hawaii, um, he, biocultural restoration, um, which focuses on restoring relationships between indigenous people and their places, as well as between them and the biodiversity that shaped the language and identities of their ancestors. Biocultural restoration is built on the notion that everything in the system is interconnected, as are the problems we perceive and the solutions to them. Um, and pictured here, a bunch of our uh, spring break camp youth, um, they're doing a, a beach cleanup. <laughs> Next slide, please. And so um, the um, presentation day, um, you know, we've talked a lot about uh, how to work with tribes and um, and so it, it's it really is through meaningful engagement and co stewardship and um, Alice um, Dr. Alice H is going to um, talk on the next slide but um, she uh, recently came to the Estuarian Research Reserve and um, she really she really went out of our way to uh, connect with us you know and as tribal tribal um members and working for our tribe we are our time is um really precious uh we're over capacity we wear many hats but she went out of her way and uh you know just invited us out to the the research reserve and and got to know us personally and uh um found out that my kids go to school with her uh they're on the same archery team and um so we just hit it off from there and um, and, you know, that's where that meaningful engagement comes in, um, you know, getting, getting to know your partners and, uh, um, you know, and I told her, uh, my, my family used to, uh, own property close to the reserve and, you know, I'd go there a lot as a child. Um, and so to, um, um, reiterate that connection and, and to be involved with the planning, um, um, and the processes, um, just all the restoration projects that they're doing um, is is really meaningful to me. And I'm probably gonna stop talking because we're out of time. Uh, Alice, next slide. <laughs> Thanks, Ashley, that was really sweet and a great overview of where we're, where we're located and, and um, the history of this place. I really appreciate it. So I'm the stewardship coordinator at the South Sioux National Estuarine Research Reserve, next slide. Um, and if we zoom down, sorry, on the uh, Southern Oregon coast here, you can see uh, Millet Coos. So Ashley gave an excellent um, overview of the tribe. So I won't reiterate that. Uh, next slide. Then you can see the South Sioux Reserve is um, colored in green here and the um, 
the brown boundary is the South Slough watershed. And then the little orange area there is a restoration project that I'm going to really cut, briefly touch on. Next slide. I'm just going to zoom through here and just give some um, very like zoom down local kind of um, specific examples. And so post stewardship at the South Slough Reserve and interactions with the tribes. It happens in all of our programs, education, research, stewardship, coastal training programs. We have MOUs, we have uh, representatives on our commission. And I'm not gonna talk about any of that. I'm gonna talk about plants because I love plants. So um, you can skip to the next slide here. So just as an example of how we're working with Ashley's tribe and the other two tribes that she mentioned, uh, we have a large watershed scale restoration project that we're really ramping up at the moment. It's called the Wasson Creek Ridgetops to Estuary Restoration Project. So it has a lot of um, ecological objectives, hydrologic connectivity, structural complexity, species habitat diversity, all those fantastic things that um, we as scientists and stewards and, and land managers really want to see in a restoration project. But I just really wanted to highlight the cultural resources and biocultural restoration. So protecting um, cultural resources, but then also improving them in our restoration efforts. Next slide, please. So um, just really like zooming right down into the, the weeds of it or not the weeds, the native plants of it. Um, just one of the very small but meaningful uh, components of this large restoration project is restoring culturally important plants in all of the different habitat zones. So we want to integrate our interactions with, with Ashley and others of the tribes throughout our entire project, throughout the entire reserve, throughout the entire region in everything that we do. Uh, next slide, please. So as an example, some of the plants that we're planting in the riparian areas, um, ocean spray. Uh, which is pronounced in uh, the language. Uh, it was used um, for a variety of technologies, including arrows, needles, combs, digging sticks, um, used for hand game, tally sticks, and tobacco pipes. <laughs> Next slide. Um, in our freshwater wetland areas, cattails. Uh, that's known as la clam. Um, that was used in basketry and it also has an edible tuber. Next slide. Uh, in our tidal forested swamp areas, Pacific crab apple. Uh, Mitch Elfquas, um, which was um, uh, eaten um, and also um, used um, for tool handles and fire tongs, shinny clubs. Next slide. And in our upland forest, the giant chain fern and the big hazel. Um, so giant chain fern, that name was lost in the language, but um, big tazel, it suits, and that was um, important, a very important basketry material, um, and it also produces an edible nut. Um, and it's important to note um, that the filberts um, that is in um, agricultural production is weaker than the native plant, so I do not utilize that in my basketry. I've tried and it's just, for some reason it's weaker. <laughs> Next slide. And now I'd like to invite Tahani, a student that worked with us at the reserve last summer on a specific project looking at beaked hazel and uh, the restoration project. Tahani. Um, aloha mai kako, o vao tihani mater no mauna lua maiau. Aloha, my name is Tihani Monter. I'm from Mauna Lua on the island of Oahu in Hawaii. Um, I am a current undergraduate student at the University of Hawaii at Manoa, and I'm also a NOAA EPP MSI scholar. So through the NOAA EPP MSI program, I ended up in Oregon this summer working at the South Lunar with Alice and Ashley. And my project this summer was looking at suitable habitat for beak tazo, which as Alice and Ashley mentioned, is one of the plants that is culturally and ecologically significant to the area. 
And I created this habitat suitability map for beak tassel, which highlighted areas within the reserves um, uplands forest that could be potentially good habitat for revegetating this beak tassel. So to do this, I used GIS data layers from the Oregon Department of State Lands, USGS, and ESRI. And I kind of made this sort of heat map that you can see on your screen. Um, I narrowed it down to areas that are preferred habitat for beak tazo based on environmental parameters like slope, aspect, soil type, and drainage. And I first had to define what preferred habitat for beak tazo is. Um, and I did this by looking at ethnobotany books and receiving input from Ashley and John Schaefer from CT Clusi. And from there, I was able to create this sort of map. Um, and in addition to looking at those environmental parameters that are preferred habitat for beak tazo, I also narrowed down these areas to highlight parts of the forested uplands that are within 100 feet of trails and roads. And this is because um, we once these plants are revegetated, um, it would be good to have them accessible for stewardship and cultural practitioners to access them. So that's just a little bit about what I did this past summer to support the reserves collaborative restoration and co-stewardship goals that Alice and Ashley have both been working very hard on. Mahalo nui. Next slide, that's it from us, Nick. Thank you folks. Okay, um, I see we're out of time. Um, I know Deanna sent a message to everybody that said uh, we're happy to stay a bit extra if people have questions they want to ask. Um, as always, you're welcome to submit questions via the exit survey or just drop them in the chat on your way out. That's totally fine, too. We will do our best to get those answered um, after the fact and included with the slides and all, um, which we'll make available in the next few days as well. Um, panelists, I don't know if you want to hop on. I see we... Um, I, I saw people were answering questions in the Q&A, so thank you for that <laughs> um, via text. Always helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, we could stay up for a bit, for a few for a few minutes at least. Like, I know I can. I don't want to put anybody on the spot, obviously. So if you have to go, then feel free to go. But Nick, I was thinking we could just wrap up with our one short piece of advice question, and then we could end since people That's have been so idea. diligent about putting their questions in the chat. Um, so, uh, for, for everyone here, um, we're just going to share a question that we, that we used at Ray to discuss this a little bit. Um, what is one short piece of advice you would give to a non-Indigenous land manager to help them support co-management and tribal sovereignty? And Leanne is off mute, therefore. <laughs> Sure. <laughs> yes. We'll start with Leanne. <laughs> thank you. So thank you. Um, I hope this is short, but this, th the goals of building successful relationships and co-managing with tribes um, is based on trust and long-term relationships. So I would advise to not go into anything expecting uh, quick fixes or turnaround or uh, relationships. So um, being prepared to invest your time and your vulnerability in this work is really important to success. Ashley, are you willing to jump on next? And then we'll go Alice. Um, sure, although I mean, Le Leanne pretty much summed it up. Um, yes, you know, just being relatable and, and being willing to build that relationship. Um, because, you know, we want almost the same things, like, you know, we're both here wanting, wanting what's best for the land, um, and that inner, um, how it's going to benefit it, the community, and so there are different views on, on how that can happen, but, you know, co, co-stewarding, and stewarding, and co-managing, um, is key, um, to including all of those, um, everyone's view, and, and coming to a happy medium. <laughs> yeah, well, I like <laughs> showing everyone that uh, as a as a staff member and not someone that was working at those really higher level governance, just I think recognizing I'm a person, you're a person, we have like really similar goals and 
wow, you like plants too? Wow, you <laughs> love this place? You want to protect this place? Excellent. Like, let's do it together. So I think not losing sight of that person to person, we're in it for, for all the good reasons, um, I think goes a long way. Uh, Tahani? Um, yeah, I think you folks, you know, this is the work you folks do. <laughs> but I guess just from my perspective, um, I would just suggest to listen and to make and hold space for community priorities. Bree? Um, one thing I would encourage is, is to do the research about the history of the place and the communities you're working with and understand, um, you know, it, it's, it's so critical to what the landscape looks like today and understand. And that's why, you know, it's such a gift for Ashley to share the history of her place. And it's really important uh, that you do that work and not ask your partners to educate you about that. Um, and it really helps going in, understanding the history and the challenges um, and, and the opportunities that could be there. Thanks. And I think the only thing that I'll add um, is to change your time frame. You know, I think we have this very short, you know, we, I was in a discussion not long ago where we talked about a 30 year plan and everyone was like, that's so long term. Um, and that's not how people think about this place. And it's not how our relationship with land really is. Um, and, and when you start to change um, your time frame, you slow down a little bit, you pay more attention, and you cease to expect an endpoint and for things to be finished, because they, they're not, they won't be. That's part of being in relationship with land. Um, uh, Nick, I think I'll pass it back to you to okay. say farewell to the nearly 100 people who stayed this long. Thanks, I know. Folks. I thank you all, <laughs> folks, for staying late. I know it's uh, it's a lot to ask to, first of all, to join anything these days that's in front of a computer for an extended period of time. So thank you for spending part of your Friday with us. Uh, there is literally nothing I could say that would be more poignant or moving than anything that our speakers have said. So I'll just say thank you for joining and have a good afternoon. <laughs> and to our speakers, thank you for sharing your expertise and you do not have to stick around. Um, I'll corral all the remaining questions that people have them. Feel free to drop them into the chat or the q and I'll pass them along to presenters. Uh, as soon as you close the session, you'll get a link to an exit survey as well. So um, if you have questions, you can share them there as well. So thank you all. Well, I'll also say bye, you guys. <laughs> See you later. <laughs>